when Seth Moulton Lynch launched a primary challenge to longtime Democratic Congressman John Tierney, most self-appointed political experts said he had no chance to win. But earlier this month, Moulton proved them wrong, besting Tierney by a surprisingly wide margin. Now many of the same prognosticators who dismissed Moulton's chances against Tierney are saying he's the odds-on favorite to beat Republican Richard Tissay in November. But as Moulton knows firsthand, in the world of politics, predictions don't count for much. And Seth Moulton is here. Welcome back to Greater Boston. Thanks. It's great to be yeah, here. Congratulations on your win. Thank you. So would, as you go around the district now, how are people responding to you? Because a lot of people were had backed John Tierney for well, sure. 18 years. And you did win by a significant margin. But a lot of people who were disappointed. How, how do they respond to you now? They're very enthusiastic. I think that they're excited to uh, have a new Democrat represent them in Congress, uh, someone who can advance the values that we care about here in Massachusetts. And I think people are excited across the country for uh, the prospect of new leadership. And uh, so I'm getting a lot of support, but I'm also working hard to earn the support of the former supporters of Congressman mm -hmm. Tierney. And I've said that very clearly, that uh, I want to, uh, to work hard to earn their trust and support, and I know that I have to, to How do, do you do that? that? <laughs> well, I mean, you reach out to them. You reach out to them. You reach out to them and say, uh, look, we had, a, we had a tough primary, but it's time to move on. And I need you. I need you to come together to make sure that we keep this seat Democratic mm -hmm. in November. You know, of course, Richard, to say quite well. You, you got together before the uh, primary. And well, I, I got said, together oh, with Congressman Tierney, too. I know. No, so I'm saying, <laughs> Congressman Tierney, to say we, gotta, we have to, you know, we have a unified mission to, to, uh, to beat uh, Tierney here. And at that point, you did. Now you have a unified mission to e beat each other. But um, how, how, do you, how do you see yourselves differing significantly? Look, I mean, just for the record, I got together with Congressman Tierney. I got together with uh, Richard Tissé, mm -hmm. just because I think that's mm -hmm. the proper thing to do before you go into a race like this. Uh, but I think that there is a big difference uh, in, in our agenda. And uh, Richard Tissé talks about being a, a moderate, but uh, no matter how moderate he is, he's still going to support the mm -hmm. national Republican agenda in Washington, D.C. And that agenda is not good for Massachusetts working families. You know, I'm going to stand up for our veterans and ensure the VA gets proper funding. I'm going to push for immigration reform. The Republicans won't hold a vote on it. I'm going to push for school ro loan reform. Uh, the Republicans won't hold a vote on it. And I'm going to work hard to bring jobs back to the 6th District. Uh, those are the things that are, those are my priorities, and I think they're the priorities of most voters up in the 6th. We had uh, Congressman Joe Kennedy on earlier in the week, and he was lamenting the fact that the president has, in my words, not his, sort of defied Congress by not allowing either a debate or a vote on additional you know, military uh, action in Syria. Where would you stand on that? I agree with uh, with Representative Kennedy. I think that this is something that the Congress needs to debate, and we need to make sure that we really have a solid plan before we uh, go into a situation that could, in the worst case, drag us into another ground war in Iraq. Now, I believe that ISIS is a threat, and we need mm -hmm. to deal with them, and the president is right uh, to be taking on the threat aggressively. Uh, but we need to be careful about what we're doing. And I've been on the ground. I've seen how a military advisory mission can become ground combat. I was a military advisor. Yeah, you did four in tours Iraq. in Iraq. I did, and actually 10 years ago on my second tour, my mission was to be a military mm -hmm. advisor uh, to an Iraqi unit when they came under fire uh, and uh, were nearly going to get overrun by a militia in Najaf. Uh, we went to their aid, and it quickly became ground combat, the worst combat of the war until that time. So I think that we need to ask tough questions. Congress needs to ask tough questions. And, you know, we've actually never had fewer veterans in Congress in our nation's mm -hmm. history. So it's important that I think we have some voices in Congress with the experience and the credibility of having been on the ground in the Middle East to really try to understand the situation and make sure that our strategy makes sense. Well, given what you just said, is there an inevitability to boots on the ground in Syria? I mean, these airstrikes go just so far. And then people relocate, and you can't find them. And is it an inevitable? I don't think it should be. I'm, I'm firmly against putting ground troops uh, in. I think at the end of the day, uh, the regional forces have got to be able to, to, 
to do this for themselves. I mean, in Iraq, ISIS swept into Iraq uh, and overran the Iraqi army. But really what happened is the Iraqi army put their weapons down and went home because they had no faith in Prime Minister Maliki's government. We've got to make sure that the political situation in Iraq is stabilized so that the Iraqi army can do its job. At the end of the day, Iraq has got to defend its own borders. If we do that job for them, we'll be back doing it again two years from now. I think the measure of success is something that's frustrating to Americans. They want to see, well, well, what's happening? What success have we had? Without, without you know, military advisors, troops on the ground, it's hard to know. You know, so we might have killed some leader in one of the extremist groups. Well, you're when right. We know? I think airstrikes are oftentimes a short-term solution, and they can be part of a, a broader strategy, but it's, it's very rare that airstrikes are sufficient on their own. So that's why we have to make sure that uh, the Iraqi army and other forces can, can do the mm -hmm. job. Uh, but I think that you know, if you look at just Iraq on its own, there, there are a lot of political problems that need to be fixed. I, I would actually be more confident if the first advisors we were sending to Iraq were political advisors to help put the Iraqi government back in place. Because if the Iraqi army had a government that it could trust to defend, then I think that we'd be in a different situation today. So on a big issue brewing here in the state, uh, whether to repeal the casino legislative bill, uh, a, a yes vote would repeal it, uh, a no vote would leave it where it stands. How do you stand on that? Well, it really is a state issue that I'm not getting involved in as a, as a federal candidate. But it affects candidate. your community, too. Sure, it does. I mean, there are a lot of people in the North Shore who are yeah. concerned about the traffic yeah. that would result and everything. That's why I'm asking you. So, right. <laughs> so on a personal level, uh, I, am, uh, I, I, I would vote for repeal because mm -hmm. I think that the long-term consequences of having casinos in the community are not good. And I hear about this a lot in the, in the Sixth up in mm -hmm. the North Shore. Uh, but I understand it's a difficult issue, and it really is something for the state to, defy, to decide. So I'm not advocating one way or another, uh, but that's the way I, I will vote. Mm -hmm. And what about on some of the other uh, local issues? You got the pre-kindergarten, you know, public school for everybody, pre-K, and the bottle bill. Uh, Pre-K is incredibly important, and I've talked about this a lot on, on, the, on the campaign trail. Uh, Pre-K is important because so many kids don't have access to it, and all these studies mm -hmm. show that it's the best investment for education dollars. But it doesn't, not having pre-K doesn't just hurt the kids who don't have pre-K today. It also hurts the kids who do but have to go to school with the kids who are not well mm -hmm. prepared. And so it really hurts everybody not to have universal pre-K. It should be something, universal. Absolutely, and I think the federal government should play a big role in helping to fund it for, for our local communities. All right, Seth Moulton, thanks for coming, and we look forward to having you here with your opponent, Richard Tissay. Thanks, it's great to be here. Come.